Tis the season to change your tires at Pep Boys. When it comes to holiday travel prep, your local Pep Boys has you covered. Buy three select tires and get the fourth one free instantly. Pep Boys offers online booking, text alerts to track your service, and mobile payments to pay on the go to get you back on the road safely. Make an appointment at PepBoys.com and don't miss out on these incredible deals. Offer valid through November 30th. Requires installation and additional fees. See store for details or visit PepBoys.com to learn more. This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 1, for broadcast on the 3rd of January, 2018. Coming up on Space Time... Fireworks predicted from what will be a rare stellar encounter this year. Bright areas on the dwarf planet Ceres suggesting geological activity. And why 2018 promised to be another stellar year for astronomy. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers are gearing up for high-energy fireworks in the next few months when a pulsar ploughs through the outer atmosphere of one of the galaxy's brightest stars. The Cosmic Light Show Spectacular will occur just 5,000 light-years from Earth. Astronomers aren't sure exactly when, but it will be soon. A report in the Journal of the Monthly Notices of the Royal Astronomical Society say the pulsar, known as J2032 plus 4127, was discovered by NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope in the constellation Cygnus the Swan. Pulsars are rapidly spinning neutron stars, a super-dense stellar cause of stars far more massive than the Sun, which have died in spectacular supernova explosions, blasts bright enough to outshine an entire galaxy. This pulsar contains about twice the mass of the Sun, all condensed down into a highly magnetised ball just 25 kilometres across, about the size of a city, and rapidly rotating at some 7 times a second. The pulsar's high rate of spin and its strong magnetic field produces a powerful energy beam, which sweeps across the galaxy like a lighthouse beacon. If the Earth is in the path of one of these beams, astronomers can detect it as a rapidly flickering pulse of energy, hence the term pulsar. Astronomers find most pulsars through radio emissions, but Fermi discovered this object in 2009 through its pulses of gamma rays, the most energetic form of light. Following its detection, astronomers began studying it in other wavelengths. However, as scientists from the Jodrell Bank Radio Telescope in Manchester observed this pulsar, they noticed something strange. They detected odd variations in the pulsar's rotation and the rate at which the rotation slows down. One of the study's authors, Professor Andrew Lyon from the University of Manchester, says the unusual behaviour indicates the pulsar isn't alone, but part of a binary system with another as yet unidentified star. Eventually, astronomers identify the culprit, a huge, hot, spectral-type BE blue main-sequence star, at least 15 times the mass of the Sun and 10,000 times brighter. The pulsar orbits its companion star, named MT91213, on a very long elongated orbit, lasting about 25 Earth years. That makes it the longest period binary system containing a pulsar known. Astronomers think the supernova explosion which originally created the pulsar also kicked it into its eccentric orbit, nearly tearing the binary system apart in the process. BE stars drive very strong stellar outflows called stellar winds, and they're embedded in large disks of gas and dust. Astronomers had identified MT91213 previously, but they had no idea it was part of a binary system. Ongoing observations have now determined that the pulsar's orbit will bring it very close to its massive blue partner early this year, plunging through its surrounding disk and triggering what should be a spectacular astrophysical fireworks display. The event will serve as a probe, helping astronomers measure the massive star's gravity, its magnetic field, stellar winds and disk properties. Several features combine to make this an exceptional binary. This pulsar binary has the greatest combined mass, the longest orbital period, and it's also the closest to Earth. Scientists are now setting up to study the stellar encounter across the entire electromagnetic spectrum using some of the world's biggest and most powerful telescopes. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary.
if you could fly aboard NASA's Dawn spacecraft, the surface of the dwarf planet Ceres would generally look quite dark, but with some notable exceptions. These exceptions are the hundreds of bright areas that stand out of the images taken by Dawn. Now, scientists have a better sense of how these reflective areas formed and have changed over time, processes indicative of an active, evolving world. The mysterious bright spots on Ceres, which have captivated both the Dawn science team and the general public, reveal evidence of Ceres' past subsurface ocean and indicate that far from being a dead world, Ceres is surprisingly active. The Deputy Principal Investigator of the Dawn mission, Carol Raymond from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, says the geological processes which created these bright spots may still be changing the face of Ceres today. Since Dawn arrived in orbit at Ceres in March 2015, scientists have located more than 300 bright areas. A new study reported in the journal Icarus by Nathan Stein from Caltech divides Ceres features into four categories. The first group of bright spots contains the most reflective material on Ceres, which is found on crater floors. The most iconic examples are those in the Okatar crater, which hosts two prominent bright areas which, from a distance, really do look like a pair of weird evil eyes staring out at Earth. Cerulea facula in the centre of the crater consists of bright material covering a 10 km wide pit within which sits a small dome. East of the crater centre is a collection of slightly less reflective, more diffuse features called Vanalia faculae. All of the bright material in Okatar crater is made of salt-rich material, which was very likely once mixed with water. Although Cerulea facula is the brightest area on all of Ceres, it would resemble dirty snow to the human eye. The leading explanation for what happened at Okatar is that it could have had, at least in the recent past, a reservoir of salty water beneath it. Vidalia faculae, the diffuse bright regions in the northeast of the crater's central dome, could have formed from a fluid driven to the surface by a small amount of gas, similar to champagne surging out of a bottle when the cork's removed. In the case of Vidalia faculae, the dissolved gas could have been a volatile substance such as water vapour, carbon dioxide, methane or ammonia. Volatile rich salty water could have been brought close to Ceres' surface through fractures that connected to a briny reservoir beneath Okatar. The low pressure at Ceres' surface would have caused the fluid to boil off as a vapour. Where fractures reach the surface, this vapour could then escape energetically, carrying with it ice and salt particles and depositing them on the surface. Cerulea facula must have formed in a somewhat different process, given that it's more elevated and brighter than Finalia faculae. The material in Cerulea may have been more like icy lava, seeping up through fractures and swelling into a dome. Intermittent phases of boiling, similar to what happened when Fenilia faculae formed, may have occurred during this process, littering the surface with ice and salt particles that formed the Cerulea bright spot. The current thinking among Dawn scientists is that when a large body slammed into Ceres, excavating the 92 km wide crater, the impact would have also created fractures through which liquid later emerged. The second and most common category includes bright material found on the rims of craters streaking down towards the floors. It's thought impacting bodies probably exposed this brighter material, which was either already in the subsurface or it formed in a previous impact event. Separately, in the third category, we have brighter material which can be formed in the material ejected when craters are formed. Then there's that strange pyramid-shaped mountain, the Nua Mons. It gets its own fourth category, the one instance on Ceres where bright material is unaffected by any impact crater. A Nua Mons is most likely a cryovolcano, that is, a volcano formed by the gradual accumulation of thick, slowly flowing icy materials. These materials have left prominent bright streaks on the volcano's flanks. Stein says previous research has shown that the bright material is made of salts, and he and his team think subsurface fluid activity transported these salts to the surface to form some of these bright areas. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash spacetime with Stuart Gary. Thank you. 
2018 promises to be another stellar year for astronomy. These events will include three partial solar eclipses through 2018. A partial solar eclipse occurs when the Sun, Moon and Earth are aligned, but not completely, so that the Moon covers only part of the Sun's surface as seen from Earth. The end result looks like something has taken a huge bite out of the side of the Sun. The first of these partial eclipses will be on February the 15th and will only be visible in parts of Chile, Argentina and Antarctica. Australia gets its turn on July the 13th, when people in Tasmania, parts of southern Victoria and those in Antarctica will be treated to a partial solar eclipse. Now if you're in Melbourne or southern Victoria, the eclipse will only be a sliver. If you're further south in Hobart or anywhere in Tasmania, it'll still only be an ever so slightly bigger sliver. The third partial eclipse for 2018 takes place on August the 11th. It'll be visible in parts of northeastern Canada, Greenland, the extreme north of Europe and northern and eastern Asia. But it will be best seen from northern Russia, where up to 68% of the sun's face will be covered. Solar eclipses always occur about two weeks before or after a lunar eclipse, and 2018 will play host to two lunar eclipses visible in Australia. The first of these total lunar eclipses starts on the night of January the 31st, lasting until the early hours of February the 1st. As well as Australia, it's also visible across most of Western North America, Eastern Asia, New Zealand and the Pacific. The second total lunar eclipse takes place on July the 27th. It'll be visible throughout Australia as well as most of Europe, Africa, Western and Central Asia and right across the Indian Ocean. Now also on July 27th, the red planet Mars will be in opposition. That means it's directly opposite the Earth from the Sun and around the same time it'll be at its closest orbital position to the Earth. In fact, the last time it was this close was back in 2003. What makes Mars' opposition so great is that the face of Mars becomes fully illuminated by the Sun. Therefore, it'll not only be closer, but also brighter than at any other time of the year. 2018 will also see the Earth having a close encounter with a comet as 46P Vatanen arrives in time for Christmas. On December the 16th, the comet will pass within 11.62 million kilometres of the Earth, reaching an estimated magnitude of between 3 and 7.5. That'll make it bright enough to be seen without the need of a telescope. Vitanin is a small, short-period Jupiter family comet, orbiting between Jupiter and the Sun every 5.44 years. It's about the size of a small mountain, roughly 1.2 kilometres wide. Interestingly, Vatan was the original target for the European Space Agency's Rosetta Comet mission. However, delays meant the comet was no longer easily reachable, and another periodic comet, 67P Sheremov Gerasimenko, was chosen as the mission's target instead. Russian astronomers predicted that Earth's orbit would cross Comet Vatanin's debris stream as many as four times between December 10 and December 14, 2012. As there had not previously been an encounter with this debris stream, it wasn't certain whether or not the meteor shower would be visible from Earth. However, there was speculation that a shower with as many as 30 meteors per hour was likely. Observers in Australia reported that on the night of December 14, 2012, as many as a dozen meteors were seen emanating from the meteor shower's predicted radiant in the constellation of Pisces, the fish. Dr Nick Lom is the curator of astronomy at the Powers Museum Sydney Observatory and every year he authors the annual Australasian Sky Guide, which we use here at Space Time as a monthly reference source for Skywatch. The 2018 edition of the Sky Guide is now available. There are so many events happening in the sky that the uh, Sky Guide had to be expanded by extra pages just to cover all the events for uh, 2018. What are some of the highlights for this upcoming year? There will be two total eclipses of the Moon. Total eclipses of the Moon are always very spectacular when the Moon uh, tends to become uh, reddish or coppery colour and they're perfectly safe to see. Also, there is an opposition of Mars as if favourable opposition of Mars, which is that Mars will be closest to the Earth for 15 years, since 2003. And 2003, people will remember that there's a lot of fuss because that was the closer than Mars has been to Earth for thousands of years. It was very red. I remember looking at it and uh, it, uh, it it just shone there. It, it wasn't just a single light point. You could see that it was this red orb hanging there in the dark sky. Yeah, it was very bright. 
and very spectacular. And this year will be just about the same. It's almost as big as it was back in uh, 2003. It's the apparent diameter is 97% of what it was in 2003. So it's very little difference from that time. So that's going to be very exciting to see. You can see just with the unaided eye, as you said, just hanging there as a red object in the sky, rising at the time of opposition around sunset and setting at sunrise, so it's in the sky all night, but it's also the best time to look at it through a telescope, even a small telescope, and features can be made out with even a reasonable size telescope, so it's a time to go to and visit an observatory or public observatory, or an amateur astronomy group has got an open night, go and, and visit, because that's the time to look at Mars and see some of the features on it. And you were talking earlier about a lunar eclipse, a total lunar eclipse. Well, it just so happens that Mars at opposition and the total lunar eclipse, or at least one of them, happened on the same day, July 27th, 28th. That's right. The opposition is on 27th and the uh, total eclipse of the Moon is on the next morning, which is nice, but in some ways it's actually a problem because the full Moon early in the night sort of uh, drowns out or at least reduces the apparent brightness of Mars. But in fact, Mars is not actually at its brightest and at its it's closest on the day of opposition, which is Friday, 27th of July, but it's still moving towards the Earth and will actually be closest to the Earth on the 31st of July, which by that stage the Moon will be out of the way, so it will be actually the best uh, night to look at the Moon will be the 31st of July. So this is a few days after the total eclipse of the Moon. So the difference between Mars being at its closest position to Earth and Mars being at opposition is involved with Mars Mars's orbit around the Sun in relation to the Earth and where it is in relation to the Earth and the Sun. That's right. It's to do with the elliptical or oval shaped path of Mars around the Sun. And it means if it was purely circular, then it would be opposition and it would be closest at, on the day of the opposition. But because it's an oval shaped path around the Sun, it's not completely sort of tangential to Earth at the time of moving parallel to the Earth on the day of opposition. So it's still approaching the Earth for the next few days. So it will be closest four days later on the 31st of July. And as I said, that's an advantage because by that stage the full moon will be gibbous and will be somewhat out of the way. So that will be the best night to observe Mars for just going outside to the backyard and seeing it as a very bright red point of light in the night sky or evening sky or ideally through a small telescope and try to make out some of the dark features on Mars. There'll be two occasions when we will be able to see all five unaided eye planets or naked eye planets in the night sky. And that's a relatively rare occurrence when we can see all the planets across the night sky. And that will take place twice during the year, once in the second half of July, in fact, just around the time of the opposition of Mars. All five naked eye planets will be visible, strung out across the ecliptic, which is uh, the path of the planets around the sun, path of the sun, moon, and the planets across the sky. And we'll see them nicely outlining that line across the sky. So that's first half of July and also in the middle of October for a couple of weeks, all five of them will be visible. That's Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. All five will be visible. So that's something that is relatively rare and fairly spectacular. Another event during the year is, of course, the Geminid meteor shower. The Geminid meteor shower is normally the best meteor shower during the year, and sometimes it's made favorable than other years due to the position of the moon. But in 2008, like it was in December 2018, the moon will be out of the way. It will be fairly close to new moon, so it will not be in the way brightening the night sky, so it will be a very good opportunity to see the Gemini meteor shower. This will be on mornings of Friday 14th of December and Saturday 15th of December. It's always around that period, but uh, 2018 provides a favourable opportunity to view the shower. Another event during the year, there's a comet Vertinen, which circles the sun every five and a half years, but in December 2018 will be exceptionally close to the Earth, at least exceptionally close in astronomical terms. It will be 11 and a half million kilometers away, but for a major comet, that is a very close distance, and that's coming up around mid-December. Certainly should be visible in binoculars, but if we're fortunate uh, from a dark sky, it might even become visible to the unaided eye. This will be the closest 
closest it has ever come, at least since it's been discovered uh, to the Earth. So it will be a very favourable opportunity to study it, and of course scientists are planning to observe it both visually and also by radar. It's coming close enough, even though it's 11.5 million kilometres, so that's 30 times as far away as the Moon, but it's still uh, close enough to be studied by radar. It will pass very close to the Pleiades star cluster on the 16th of December, and that's actually the night that it will be closest to the Earth, and it's only a few days after it, it's making its closest pass to the Sun, so it means that the comet will be at its brightest. And so the 16th of December is certainly a, a night to sort of mark in the calendar to try and see the comet, but there are, um, certainly by binoculars finding the Pleiades, and it should be... Uh, somewhere nearby and uh, near the Pleiades so it should be worthwhile to have a look at and of course for information on all the events we've talked about today we can find those in the annual Sky Guide and the 2018 edition is out now that's right it's on sale now it's a compact paperback form so very easy to carry around whether it's in the glove box of a car or in a backpack and the easiest way to get it is to either go to the Powerhouse Museum Sydney Observatory or um, order it online that's right but it is available from uh, good bookshops as well so most bookshops Shops would either have it or will be uh, happy to order it in. Are you taking a break at all? Uh, no, we podcast? get straight through. We're up to 80,000 listeners a week now. Oh, that's very impressive. Mainly in Australia, um, or do you have, the actual, have some in the States? Yeah, 86,472 listeners a week. All right. And the largest country is Australia with 43,000, the United States with 19,000, the United Kingdom with 7,000, Canada 4,000, New Zealand 1,000, Sweden 1,000. Then you got smaller figures for Norway, the Netherlands, Spain, France, and uh, yeah, they're, they're, the, they're the top ten anyway. Wow, that really is international. Yeah, it's That's interesting because good. when it was star stuff at the ABC, we had an average yeah. audience of about 23,000 listeners a week. Right. So we've gone from 23,000 with the ABC to 86,472 listeners a week since we've been on our own. Yeah. It's been busy, but yeah. good fun. All right, excellent. That's Dr. Nick Lom, the consultant curator of astronomy at the Powerhouse Museum, Sydney Observatory. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study warns that adolescents who identify as gay, lesbian or bisexual are far more likely to consider or attempt suicide than their heterosexual peers. The research by scientists from the University of Pennsylvania, the University of California and the San Diego State University and published in the Journal of the American Medical Association supports a multitude of previous studies dating back decades which have consistently shown far higher suicide rates among gay kids. The new study looked at a national representative sample of 15,624 high school aged US teenagers. They found 40% of gay, lesbian and bisexual teens seriously considered suicide compared to just 15% of their heterosexual counterparts. And a quarter of gay, bisexual and lesbian kids actually attempted suicide compared to just 6% of straight kids. Researchers found that gay and bisexual males were at the greatest risk of suicide. In fact, they were five times more likely to try suicide compared to heterosexual males in the same age group. Scientists also found that sexual minority youth, that's the term they used, were some 2.45 times more likely to consider suicide, 3.59 times more likely to plan suicide, and 3.37 times more likely to attempt suicide than similar straight kids. Looking deeper into the data, researchers found that the relative suicide risks were further heightened among gay males, especially bisexual boys. Some 39% of bisexual boys, compared to 10% for non-gay or bisexual boys, had seriously considered suicide. Overall, nearly a third of bisexuals reported attempting suicide in the past 12 months, and 46% had considered it a viable option. Researchers conclude there are clearly differences in how sexual minority adolescents experience the world compared to their straight counterparts. External stresses like stigma and isolation are significant contributing factors, and those factors weigh heavily on members of these high-risk communities, especially at such a difficult time in their lives. However, if they can get through this period, there is good news, because a new study claims that same-sex couples are the happiest of all couples. 
However, the news isn't all good, because while gay and lesbian couples tend to have a better quality of relationship than straight couples, it seems bisexual people tend to have the lowest relationship quality. The findings are reported in the journal Family Relations. The research is based on a study by Australian scientists who asked 9,000 Aussies about their relationships, including how often they discuss something calmly, how often they work together on a project, or how often they considered breaking up with their partner. Scientists also had them rate the overall happiness of the relationship. The authors say the results clearly show that assumptions about same-sex relationships being unhappy or dysfunctional are wrong. A new study has found that human-caused climate change made the record rainfall that fell over Houston during Hurricane Harvey roughly three times more likely and 15% more intense. The findings, reported in the Journal of Environmental Research Letters, used multi-method analyses drawing upon both observed rainfall data and high-resolution climate models, which found that heavy rainfall events are increasing substantially across the Gulf Coast region directly because of anthropogenic global warming. Scientists say the takeaway message from the research is that Harvey was more intense because of today's climate, and storms like Harvey are also more likely in today's climate. Harvey made landfall on August the 25th near Corpus Christi in Texas as a Category 4 hurricane and then stalled. As a tropical storm, it dropped more than 30 inches of rain across southeast Texas, causing catastrophic record-breaking flooding in Houston and surrounding areas. In fact, in East Harris County, a record 51.89 inches of rain, the highest storm total in U.S. history, was recorded over the six-day period from August 25 to August 30. Scientists have developed new computer simulations to better understand the Yellowstone supervolcano, which dominates the western United States. Recent stories in the national media are magnifying fears of a catastrophic eruption of Yellowstone, but scientists remain uncertain about the likelihood of such an event. The heat needed to drive volcanism usually occurs in areas where tectonic plates meet and one slab of crust slides or subducts under the other. However, Yellowstone and other volcanic areas of the inland western US are all far away from the active plate boundaries along the Pacific west coast. In these inland cases, a deep-seated heat source known as a mantle plume is suspected of driving the crustal melting and surface volcanism. A new study, reported in the journal Nature Geoscience, used seismic tomography to peer deep into the subsurface of the western US, in the process piecing together the geologic history behind the volcanism. Using supercomputers, the authors ran different tectonic scenarios to observe a range of possible geologic histories for the western US over the past 20 million years. Surprisingly, the efforts yielded little support for the traditional mantle plume hypotheses. Hot subsurface material like that found in a mantle plume should rise vertically towards the surface. But that wasn't what the researchers found in their models. Instead, it appears the mantle plume under the western United States is actually sinking deeper into the Earth over time. And all that suggests that something closer to the surface, an oceanic slab originating from the western tectonic boundary, is interfering with the rise of the plume. So these new models are instead tending to point to the extensive inland volcanism actually originating from the shallow oceanic mantle to the west of the Pacific northwest coast. A new study suggests that Homo sapiens may well have reached their maximum limits for height, lifespan and physical performance. A report in the journal Frontiers of Physiology suggests that humans have biological limitations and that anthropogenic impacts on the environment, including climate change, could have a deleterious effect on these limits. The study reviewed 120 years of historical information, considering the effects of both genetic and environmental parameters. Despite stories that with each generation humans are living longer and longer, this review suggests there may be a maximum threshold to Homo sapiens biological limits that can't be exceeded. Rather than continually improving, there will instead be a shift in the proportion of the population reaching the previously recorded maximum limits. Examples of the effects of these plateaus will be evidenced with increasingly less sports records being broken and more people reaching but not exceeding the present highest life expectancy. And observing decreasing tendencies may provide some early signs that something's changed, but not for the better. And finally for now, experts are warning of a significant peak in the risk of chocolate poisoning for dogs and cats over the holiday period as households stock up on festive treats. A report in the journal Vet Record reminds us that chocolates contain theobromine, a stimulant similar to caffeine that can cause vomiting, increased heart rate, agitation and seizures, even death, in dogs and cats. Although chocolate's long been recognised as a common cause of serious and often fatal illnesses and deaths in pets, scientists wanted to investigate whether chocolate exposure followed any sort of a seasonal pattern. 
They analysed records from 229 veterinary practices between 2012 and 2017 for consultations relating to chocolate exposure around Christmas, Easter, Valentine's Day and Halloween. After taking into account potential influential factors such as age, gender and breed, they found 386 cases from 375 individual animals, meaning some were fed chocolate more than once. One in four cases, or 26%, presented within one hour of eating chocolate, and over half, some 56%, presented within six hours. Vomiting was frequently noted in 64 of the cases, or 17%, while heart rates above 120 beats per minute was recorded in 28 cases, or 7.5%. And neurological signs such as agitation and restlessness were found in 12 cases or 3%. Chocolate exposure was less common in older dogs aged 4 to 8 years and more common in young dogs under 4 years of age. No particular breed was associated with any specific increased risk. Scientists found chocolate exposure was four times more likely to be recorded at Christmas time and almost twice as likely to be recorded at Easter compared to non-festival dates. There were no peaks around Valentine's Day or Halloween. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Times also broadcast coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio, and as part of Virgin Australia's in flight entertainment. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook. Just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 